so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, bladder cancer and survival. So, you know, as Stephanie brought up and as we talked about before, it's much more likely that if um, a patient has bladder cancer, that um, they're male. Um, the ratio of bladder cancer in men to women, it's very stage dependent, but it's between three and about four to one, um, the ratio of men to women. But then when you look at the patients who wind up succumbing to bladder cancer, it's much more likely that if you're a woman, if you have bladder cancer, you're at a higher risk of dying of the disease than if you're a man with bladder cancer. And we have that statistic on this slide as well, if you can click to that. Um, so these are numbers from 2018. And when we look across diseases, um, other kinds of cancers comparing men to women, as far as I know, this is the only one where the risk of death in women is higher than that in men. Next slide. So what's at the root of some of these differences um, in survival? And this is starting to get to some of those questions that we had in the beginning slide where we, start, where we were talking a little bit about framework. So in terms of presentation with symptoms, do women present with symptoms that are different than men? Well, as far as we know, they don't. Um, women present uh, the majority of patients with bladder cancer present with gross hematuria, meaning blood that you can see in your urine. Um, sometimes patients have what's called microscopic hematuria. That means that on a urinalysis, um, a doctor would tell you that you have red blood cells, um, but you can't actually see that. Having blood in places where it's not supposed to be is very irritating. And so that's why patients with bladder cancer or patients who have blood in their urine for whatever reason, you know, 10 to percent of their doctors, it's bothersome. They have frequency, which means they have to go to the bathroom all the time. They have urgency, which means that when they, you have to go, you have to go, you have to find the bathroom, you know, as quickly as you can. Um, having these symptoms might keep people up at night or might keep them from, you know, spending time in a meeting at work or finishing a movie um, and being able to go on a long drive. Um, so it definitely impacts quality of life and these tend to be symptoms that get people's attention. What about um, getting to the diagnosis and delay? Um, so we know that especially because bladder cancer is a cancer of older people and that a lot of men may interact with a urologist in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, that if they do have blood in their urine, they might just pick up the phone, um, have, give that complaint to their urologist's office and could potentially be seen within days or within 24 hours. For women, the likelihood of interacting with the urologist prior to presenting with bladder cancer is probably a lot lower. And so women will have a different route and a different narrative typically when um, they come to see either um, SEMA or I, you know, saying that they presented to the primary care doctor or maybe to urgent care and may have had other referrals, other testing done and, um, and other treatment modalities for what was thought to be a non-cancer diagnosis. Um, Seema's gonna talk a little bit about completeness of evaluation later in the talk, but we think that these three factors, presentation with symptoms, diagnosis and delay, and completeness evaluation may um, have something to do with stage of presentation. So we know that, you know, comparing head to head, women tend to present at a later stage, which means the tumor is more either locally advanced, moving, into the wall of the bladder, into lymph nodes, or even metastatic when compared to men. Um, and, and those three preceding factors may relate to that. Treatments that are offered. So from a medical oncology standpoint, once we see patients in our office, um, do we treat patients differently based on their gender? We'll talk a little bit about that and how the patients respond to therapy. So less is known about that, but we'll present that data. And then finally, we'll end by talking a little bit about tumor biology. Are there differences um, across the board between men and women when it comes to tumor biology? We're starting to learn more about that. Next slide. I'll pass it back to Seema to um, start talking a little bit about social determinants of health. So a little bit about what Jeannie was talking about is women experience the healthcare system different than, than men do. And that's what we mean by social determinants of health. How does a delay in diagnosis, access to treatment, and healthcare disparities or issues influenced by gender kind of lead to how people 
seek health, um, healthcare and health, and and how they can actually interface and access our medical system, which is very different based on someone's personal background. That is balanced out with actual tumor biology. And it's the interplay of these, these things that may be the reason why women do worse after diagnosis with bladder cancer. Part of it is access to treatment, and then the other part is the actual tumor and the biology of the tumor. Next slide. So when people present with symptoms with bladder, uh, with bladder cancer, mainly hematuria or urinary symptoms, as Jeannie said, many different physicians have guidelines on what do you do when someone comes in your office and they've got blood in the urine, if it's microscopic or if you can actually visibly see it, meaning they have to dip it um, and, um, or, uh, or actually see it or you can actually see it when you pee in the toilet. And so our colleagues in internal medicine have these guidelines. Um, Stephanie, can you hit the, the next tab for the rest of the animations? Um, our OB-GYN colleagues have guidelines because a lot of women seek care with our OB-GYNs. And, and we as urologists also have guidelines that tell us what to do. Most of the time we only find malignancy in about three to 5% of people who have microscopic hematuria and 23% of people who have gross hematuria. So although that, that is a lot in terms of gross hematuria and it's a, and it's a number, if you end up in that three to 5%, most of the time our diagnostic workups come up, don't really come up with, with anything. Next slide. So this is a really nice study and I'm, I'll try to, um, uh, dial down this slide because there's a lot of numbers and a lot of things on here. But the basics is that they, that um, Matt Nielsen and colleagues looked at all of the different guidelines from all of the different groups, from Kaiser, from our AUA, which is our national organization, from Canada, from Europe, um, from our internal medicine colleagues. And they said, if you follow these guidelines, how many people would you diagnose cancers in and how many people would you miss? And if you look across the board, most settled on being able to diagnose about 2,900 cancers. Um, and they all have a little different miss rates. The Dutch guidelines miss, miss a little more and our AUA guidelines miss the less because they're the most intense. But when you look at what happens when you do all of these testings, cystoscopies, where we take a camera and insert it into the urethra in the bladder, um, where we do CT scans to, to try to look at the upper urinary tracts, the, the renal pelvis or the ureters that collect urine, um, all of those tests that we do can also have bad outcomes. Radiation, you can get an allergy from the dye, you can get kidney dysfunction, you can get urinary tract infections. And so a lot of these guidelines are meant to balance finding cancers, but not causing harm. Next slide. What we do know that in women, there is a diagnostic delay. And we know that from symptoms to diagnosis of bladder cancer, there's almost 20 days difference between um, women and men, that men actually get to a cystoscopy a lot quicker. Um, and that way, they get into treatment and, and are able to start the next step quicker. And so that's a de definitely a problem because you would think if you present with the same kind of symptoms and you follow the same guidelines, that then you would end up with diagnosis at the same time. Next slide. So when you look at this from a numbers perspective, um, you. I can go over that a little bit too. You actually see that women get a lot more testing, a lot more uh, cultures, but more importantly, they get a lot more antibiotics prescribed without evaluation. And this is what we were talking about before that, um, that a lot of times in women, people aren't thinking about bladder cancer. So you end up getting antibiotics and you end up getting it without the urine culture and proving that there's actually an infection. And we think that that might play a little bit in the diagnostic delay that, not thinking about bladder cancer um, makes you think about, okay, it's most likely a urine and tract infection. It usually is, but what we wanna get physicians and, and providers to do is sort of prove that. Um, next slide. So when women do get a hematuria evaluation, um, what happens? How is it different than men? 
it turns out it's actually less complete. And so this is a study by uh, the group down at UCLA. And when you look at those green boxes um, and you focus on that side of the graph, there, it's white men, black men, white women, and black women. And when you look at race, there's a little difference, but more importantly, the difference is in gender, that men get a whole complete hematuria evaluation and women don't. Next slide. So what does a complete evaluation mean? One of it is that you have to directly look in the bladder with a camera or a cystoscope. And so that's an office-based procedure that we do. Um, it's not the most fun thing to experience and we're working on ways of making it better or finding other ways of, of finding bladder cancer, but it is what we have now and it helps us figure out um, tumor type, size, what we're gonna do, how we're gonna figure out what the next step is, meaning what the stage is. We have imaging and scans. Um, we rely on a mixture of ultrasounds, CT scanners where you go in, in a machine or even MRIs nowadays to help us tell, well, are we worried about any spread, lymph nodes, um, any, any blockage of the ureters, any tumors in your upper tract? And that's what a completeness of evaluation really sort of tells us. You want to then go in and actually do a good transurethral resection. You want to get a good tumor sample. You want to be able to really um, tell a patient what their stage is, and then we really determine treatment uh, based on that stage. Stephanie, can you hit the next animations? And so it's really stage that that that's what drives what we re then recommend to do. Are you non-muscle invasive? Are you muscle invasive? Or are you metastatic, meaning has it gotten out of the bladder? Next slide. When you deviate from the standard, when you don't do a complete evaluation, that definitely affects outcomes. So this graph over here on the right shows that when patients have muscle present at the time of resection, when you're actually trying to diagnose someone's bladder cancer, you do better. Um, and when you have muscle absent or not mentioned, you do uh, worse in terms of survival. So this is pretty important. And this is with all grades, which is graph A, and just with high grade only, which is graph B. Stephanie, can you hit the next for the animation? And so another portion of this is you have to then do timely treatment. And so if you don't, if you have a delay in diagnosis and then you don't do a good evaluation, and then it takes you a long time to get to your treatment, we know that if you, if you have a delay in going to cystectomy, um, we usually use the time period of three months that then outcomes are worse, that patients die at a greater rate than if you kind of are able to do a timely treatment. Next slide. And now I'm gonna turn, turn it back over to Jeannie to talk a little bit about um, what that means in terms of uh, differing stages in women presenting with more advanced disease. Thanks, Seema. So this slide shows um, a slide, a, a study that was done and published in the Scandinavian Journal of Urology. And I think one thing that is kind of important and inter interesting is that this is a phenomenon, diagnostic delay and um, higher stage in women compared to men. This is a phenomenon that's not just seen in the United States. Um, this is a phenomenon that's seen in Europe, as well as in Japan, where you know there's a high incidence of, of bladder cancer as well. So, you know, understanding that interaction with the healthcare system may be different um, in those countries, that um, I think at least we can be comforted is the right word, but at least we know that this is a phenomenon that's not unique to the United States. Um, and so is it a phenomenon that um, kind of all patients and all, you know, physicians are falling into, or is it something else that's going on? And I think at least for me, this points to other factors besides diagnostic delay that are leading women to present with um, later stage disease. So this is just one example of that, the study that we show in 2016. Um, we have another study at the National da da uh, data, uh, Bladder Cancer Database of uh, thir three, over 300,000 women, and that's looking uh, at a little bit of an older sample between 2004 and 2013, just showing that women are more likely than men to have locally advanced or metastatic bladder cancer. And then if you can hit the next button, Stephanie. 
Um, and then this table here, um, like uh, like Seema said earlier, a lot of numbers and a little bit confusing, but it breaks down um, the relative survival of stage one or greater bladder cancer in the United States according to the stage and according to sex. So stage one is a non-muscle invasive tumor. Stage two is a muscle invasive tumor. Stage three is a locally advanced tumor. And then stage four, current staging months, patients with lymph node positive disease as well as metastasis, um, meaning tumors outside of the local bladder area that can be managed either by radiation or surgery. And we know that um, year for year and stage for stage, women have a worse prognosis um, compared to men. Next slide. Um, so this is looking at some of the gender-based as well as other factors in terms of how patients interact with the healthcare system. So we know it's not just gender, but also race, um, socioeconomic status, as well as insurance that all come into play when patients are interacting with the healthcare system. Um, so this was the study that was done by one of our colleagues, Dr. Josh Meeks from the University of Chicago, um, just showing that patients who have on the left-hand panel of the uh, of the graph, the first quartile SES compared to the fourth quartile SES, which means that patients with a higher socioeconomic status um, tended to have higher rates of chemotherapy as well as definitive cystectomy compared to those with lower. Um, that's just kind of across the board, and I think there are probably a lot of factors that are related to that. Um, but dishearteningly, I think, Looking across race, there's there's definitely differences looking across male to female, and then also private or Medicare compared to Medicaid insurance. Um, these are not numbers that make you know anybody in the healthcare industry um, happy, but I think to at least have them published and to understand what these differences are, so we can at least be aware of them um, as we go in um, to clinic and see patients every day is important, and to think about how to improve upon these historic numbers again looking at a retrospective or looking back in time in a data set between 2004 and 2013. Next slide. So, you know, some other interesting data, um, and not all data um, kind of conforms to this. There's some studies that are in support of this concept and some that are not. But these are at least two trials or, that show that um, from a population, large population database, that when women have the bladder removal, which is called a radical cystectomy, which is surgery that, that Seema Porton does, um, that they tend to do worse than men. And again, the reasons for this are not um, completely understood. It does not seem to be based on um, their stage of diagnosis. And there are at least two studies, um, and there are more that actually um, show this phenomenon. Next slide. 